Taliban is taking control of more of Afghanistan and is closing in on the capital, Kabul. The president says he won't allow 20 years of gains to be lost in a civil war. But what can Ashraf Ghani do to stop the Taliban advance? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Kim Vanell. The future of Afghanistan is topping most international agendas this week, with many fearing a return to the Taliban rule of 20 years ago. The group is continuing to make strong advances across the country, taking control of major cities. It's also managed to release thousands of prisoners and looted military barracks, some of which were run until last month by the United States. As hundreds of thousands of Afghans flee their homes trying to find safety elsewhere, President Ashraf Ghani is determined that the Taliban will not win. I am not going to allow this imposed war on our nation to lead to more bloodshed and to losing the gains of our last two decades and damages to our public goods and infrastructure because of this. I've carried out widespread comprehensive consultations with representatives of the people and leaders and with our international partners. Consultations are being carried out in a speedy manner. And the United States, which is sending 3,000 troops to speed up the evacuation of its staff from the embassy in Kabul, says it continues to support a political settlement. Going forward, we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to make sure that a terrorist threat can't emanate from Afghanistan again by maintaining robust over-the-horizon counterterrorism capabilities in the region. Um, and we're going to continue to support our Afghan partners uh, bilaterally through maintenance support, through financial support, uh, and we're going to continue to, to, to want to see a, a stable, secure Afghanistan. The, the other thing I would say uh, is that we want to continue to see that there's a negotiated political settlement here uh, for governance going forward. We'll bring in our guests in just a moment, but first this report from Charlotte Ballas, who is in the capital. President Ghani has addressed the nation in a pre-recorded address from the presidential palace. In this address, he said that he was looking out for his people, that he wished security forces well, that they needed to see improvement in coordination of the security forces, and he wanted any bloodshed to stop. The big question is, how does he stop the bloodshed? And in the speech, he said that there were consultations ongoing with local and international partners. We understand that some of those negotiations do involve his own future, whether or not he will be able to stay on as president for negotiations with the Taliban to continue and some type of political settlement to be reached. The Taliban certainly have him under a lot of pressure. They had a leader from Western Afghanistan, Ismail Khan, who was very anti-Taliban, but when Harat fell just a couple of days ago, uh, he surrendered to the Taliban and they have sent him to Kabul with a message to try to convince other government leaders to step away from Ghani and join some type of political settlement with them. Ghani is also under a lot of pressure as the Taliban keep taking more and more provincial capital and those provincial capitals get ever closer to Kabul. They now control much of the south, much of the north, and provinces, a province directly to the south of Kabul, and they are pressing on a pro province just to the west of Kabul also. A panic is growing in Kabul. There has been a run on the banks. Ticket prices for flights out of Kabul have skyrocketed, and a lot of people are becoming increasingly concerned as the Taliban come closer to Kabul. Charlotte Ballas for Inside Story. Okay, let's bring in our guests. Joining us from Kabul, Shinkai Karokhail, a member of Afghanistan's National Parliament and chairwoman of the Parliamentary Women Caucus. In Istanbul, Harun Rahimi, Assistant Professor of Law at the American University of Afghanistan. And from London, Sir Nick Kay, former UK ambassador to Afghanistan. A very warm welcome to you all. Uh, I'd like to start with you, Harun Rahimi. What's your sense of what's happening in the country, where all of this is heading? It, it's not headed uh, towards a good place. Um, the people I talk to underground, um, they all express despair. Um, all the young generation, the generation that was a product of the last 20 years of investment, uh, doesn't feel like they have a place in Afghanistan anymore. And everyone is looking for a way to leave. Those who can do leave. Uh, 
these are not people who are used to Western values, or these are not people who want to live like Americans or Europeans. These are some of people who have lived through the Taliban war. And these are ordinary Afghans, some of them very conservative, very socially conservative. But they still, they even concluded that there is really uh, nothing to live for in Afghanistan anymore. That's the state of how people are feeling. The political situation you just reported on, it's just the, the, the hope for a, some form of deal um, that will be reached to save Kabul, make sure that the Kabul is not going to come under attack, and some sort of power-sharing agreement will be reached, and Taliban would not take over militarily, turning themselves into a pariah and making Afghanistan into an oppressive regime that we all remember from the 90s. Um, that's the only hope people have. Um, and not a lot of people are hopeful about that either, but that's the only option we have moving forward. Mm. So, Nick Kay, do you agree with that assessment? What's your take on where this is headed? Will the Taliban bring the war to Kabul? Thank you very much indeed. And yes, no, I agree very much with what Harun was saying. These are very difficult and incredibly concerning times. My heart goes out to, to all uh, Afghan friends and colleagues who are facing uh, the dangers and the challenges that they are and must absolutely condemn as an international community the, the actions of the Taliban up till now, some reports of the, the war crimes potentially that they're committing horrendous. Um, so... At this stage, the really important thing is to take a pause. The Taliban are heading at the moment full speed, it seems, to try a military assault upon Kabul. And that would be a disaster. It would be a disaster for Kabul, it would be a disaster for wider Afghanistan, and it would be a disaster for the Taliban as well. So I think they need to apply the brakes, wait, discuss, negotiate, and find what all parties have been looking for 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 some time now, really, is a political settlement that is an inclusive political dispensation, not just the Taliban, but a broad Afghan interim administration is what is being talked about now. Shinkai Karakhail, I'd like to bring you in. Do you think the Taliban will do that? Will it take a pause before it heads to Kabul? Because it has made rapid gains. It clearly has the upper hand militarily, uh, at least outside of the capital. Well, it's very difficult to predict what will happen tomorrow even, uh, uh, because even Taliban, most of India, they didn't fight to, to, to occupy those provinces. But I think, uh, unfortunately, whatever was the reason behind that, uh, the, the, the army and the police and intelligence didn't uh, defend or like uh, just uh, um, uh, surrender to Taliban. You know, at least it is not like a victory through proper... Uh, classic war uh, inside Afghanistan. Uh, I'm not sure what will happen, but because the Taliban, I hopefully they think that they should not like a, a military attack uh, Kabul and to, because the way the, the other places, the, because of uh, the low moral, low uh, maintenance or uh, support, whatever it was, they, they surrender uh, those areas to Taliban. If it happened in Kabul, I think nobody will control that. that uh, the, the insurgency or the, the um, war inside Kabul as well. And I think that will cost everyone a lot. Because today we, we had a very bad experience in Kunal province uh, while the people start to attack, like uh, some of the, the um, uh, people attacked, the, 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 they looted them, the market or uh, this kind of thing. If they happen and they try to throw a stone towards uh, the army, and I think this is the, the worst experience. I hope it didn't happen uh, inside Kabul because uh, but Taliban should understand that it's not only Taliban they fight against the government, but they're a multi terrorist group. They are, they are also a part of this insurgency throughout the country. So many people are involved in this conflict, organized crime group, mafias, uh, warlords. You know, there's a different group have a different interests. I think there's lots of interference from, from the regional countries. Like uh, if they attack in Kabul, I think nobody will, man like, uh, I don't think they will like uh, really manage or control the the, the disaster inside Kabul. Hopefully the Taliban understand and stop like going towards military uh, victory. This will be better to, to go for a proper solution through a peace talk and peace process. If they really in, uh, want to really save this country, to, to save the, the infrastructure in this country, to save the private and public properties, and, and also to reduce the, the tense and the pressure or the the, the stress which people are going through. OK. Um, I'd like to come back to you, Harun Rahimi. What do you make of uh, what Ashraf Ghani had to say today? Some were expecting him to resign. Obviously, that didn't 
happen. What was your takeaway from what he had to say? He basically had nothing to say. You have to I remember that the, over the past 48 hours, a lot of territories has been has been lost. Uh, two major cities of Afghanistan fell, and uh, he did not say anything. He was a complete media blackout from the ARC and uh, the presidential palace and people around him. After two days, he emerged and basically said nothing. Um, the things he said really don't mean anything for the people on the ground. In my assessment, in my view, it's not about President Ghani anymore. I don't think he is the person to negotiate uh, on behalf of the anti-Taliban camp. He's widely unpopular in Afghanistan. In my, in my hometown, Herat, most people blame him for the fall of Herat. People believe he was the reason that Herat fell, that the government forces did not fight. He, they believe he instructed them. I'm not saying it's true or not, but I'm saying that's the psychology underground. You cannot have a person like that credibly negotiate on behalf of anti-Taliban camp. So it is vital for us to be able to preserve some sort of a compromise, some sort of a mix of the Taliban views and the views of their opponents, that it would be an credible person negotiating on behalf of the anti-Taliban camp. President Ghani is not that person. And I think the time is not on the President Ghani or the government side. Uh, the Taliban, uh, the, the government leverage is shrinking. The, as you reported, there are heavy fighting in, happening in Mazar. If, Hara, if Mazar falls, if the encircling of Kabul gets to the point that, as uh, uh, as uh, um, was said, it, the Kabul becomes a battleground of different factions fighting, not even Taliban. There mm. are many uh, bad actors that can actually start fighting in Kabul. If that becomes the case, the government loses all leverage. I mean, the anti-Taliban camp loses all leverage to make any deal. Okay. And I think the President Ghani, the sooner he resigns um, and the more orderly that transition happens to a transitional authority, the better the outcome for the Afghans. So, Nick Kay, do you agree with that assessment? Does uh, Ashraf Ghani have the legitimacy, have the support of the people to be able to negotiate on behalf of the government? Uh, I agree that there is an absolute need for a fully inclusive Afghan uh, republic uh, negotiation team uh, that has been established, uh, led by Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, the High uh, Peace and Reconciliation Commission, um, and and there is no doubt that in Afghanistan, no one group can ever successfully rule uh, and speak for the whole nation. It is a nation that is so diverse, and its strength and its beauty is its diversity and plurality. And that absolutely needs to be respected and represented in uh, in whatever team and whatever negotiation takes place. Okay. But but let me let me just also pause a little bit. I'm old enough to have been in Kabul in 1996 when the Taliban arrived and uh, and met them three four days after their arrival in Kabul. Now that happened very quickly in the end as well. And I think it would be a mistake for the Taliban to repeat the same experience now. They're running now. They've got the wind behind them. They're rushing headlong downhill, feeling very excited and feeling very victorious. But they are about to crash into a wall if they carry on like this. What is that wall? The wall they crash into is a divided nation, and it is divided. Um, it will also be an isolated nation if they take Kabul by force. And it's a nation facing incredible humanitarian challenges. Already there were five and a half million people food insecure before the offensive started. Now that number is even higher and the number of IDPs and refugees, et cetera. So they're hurtling into potentially becoming responsible for a country that is in dire straits. Mm. They need to pause, they need to put on the brakes and this needs to be properly managed for the benefit and interest of all Afghans, and I would say the regional countries as well. Whether the Taliban, whether the Taliban listens to that kind of uh, advice, I guess you could put it, is another thing. Um, Shinkai Karokhale, we're talking there about the last time that Afghanistan was under Taliban rule. What do you think a future Afghanistan under Taliban rule would look like? Has the Taliban learned any lessons of the past 20 years? Would it look the same? Well, we actually we were expecting and many times women of Afghanistan like uh, uh, challenge them and even ask them that if you really change that you have to reopen the school under the, uh, the control under uh, the, the, the area under your control. 
Unfortunately, even girls' school were not open, and some of the women's activities were uh, absolutely closed down. So this is the big concern of women, and many times we, we had this concern, and we would uh, uh, try to convince the government and the international community to support to have more women at the table of negotiation, and women's rights issues should be the center of the, the, uh, the discussion with the Taliban. Taliban also tried to escape, and also, unfortunately, in Afghanistan, might the women's rights issue is not very much priority for, for, for the main politician of this country. So our, our concern is that why Taliban were not able to clearly announce their position regarding or their policy regarding women's uh, uh, political future or social or any activity with, with which women has the right to do it. And they should like make sure that women has equal rights, that there will be no restriction um, on them. and. Uh, like, so this this is why, why women of Afghanistan are really have a concern. Like uh, Mr. Harun said that why people are start to flee the country because they are concerned about their daughter future, mm. the education, their, their higher education, and, uh, their work. So that's why people think they are, they are not changed. They are the same, and even uh, some of the things which happen, especially some of the the crime happen uh, during this like last two three weeks. People have a like huge concern even. Taliban tried to deny, maybe some other group did it, but now, because the war started by the Taliban, everybody like labeled them that you did it, or maybe you provide the ground for those who, who did this crime. So this is a huge concern for women of Afghanistan, and hopefully Taliban realize this concern and give a positive response to that. I think they have to change if they really want to have a political future in this country, because people of Afghanistan, what is were good or bad, people are like, expecting that the future government should be should be also through the proper election. People have the right to vote and and have the right to to choose. Mm. So this can is I, the concern. Can I like just interrupt you there? Can I, can I just interrupt you there to ask you? I mean, you're a member of Afghanistan's national parliament, chairwoman of the parliamentary women caucus. Are you worried at all about your own safety? Well, definitely that because uh, you know women have a more liberal stand. A, a, a priority or women's equal right, equality, equity, and a, a woman wants to be considered as an equal citizen of this country. Those uh, 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 like advantage which we had in our constitution, they want to preserve that. They want uh, uh, want to have a, a, a very active life life which, which we had so far. Girls should have a, a access to um, the education, higher education. So uh, 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 the equal right, but the men deserve it. You know. So well, women, I, I think entire women politician or political activists and women rights activists, everybody's just concerned, about, not about them, but also even about their family safety. Mm -hmm. Because uh, nobody knows what will happen. Yeah. What will be the, 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 the future uh, policy and position of Taliban regarding, uh, regarding this? As so, you said, there's a so lot of unknowns. All... There's a lot of unknowns. Harun Rahimi, UN Chief Antonio Guterres says seizing power through military force uh, is a losing proposition for the Taliban, and that will lead to the complete isolation of Afghanistan. Do you think that is true, and do you think that that will factor into the Taliban's calculations here? I mean, the, I believe the Taliban want different things, and some of the things they want are contradictory. They want to reimpose their old version of their Emirat, which would result in l severe uh, restrictions of women's rights, which would mean loss of the most of the gains of the past 20 years, the life people have come to expect, feel uh, like they deserve and want. Uh, that's what they want. They also want international recognition uh, because I think they have the experience of their last government, at least their elders do, um, if the fighters on the ground don't remember because many of them are young. Uh, that they realized that it was impossible to govern and be a functioning state w without international recognition. Um, I think that they want contradictory things. How this contradiction is going to be resolved, what trade-offs they, they are willing or will be able to make, um, that, that remains to be seen. But I would like to actually um, um, pick up what uh, Mr. Ambassador said. A lot has been said about international legitimacy and recognition, but I think we don't pay enough attention to domestic legitimacy. If Taliban are not recognized by most people of Afghanistan as a legitimate, as a part of a legitimate government, they cannot be their legitimate government because they don't represent the entire country. If they cannot, uh, it cannot be. If they will not be recognized as a part of a legitimate government that has come 
to power through negotiation through a mechanism that includes everyone, and they choose to take power by force, they will face definitely uh, a divided nation, a nation that does not sub that, that does not see them as legitimate, and that means they they will maybe um, I believe they can through brute force maybe impose their power, but they won't be able to get the education started. They will not be able to stimulate an economy and, and do many things that would help Afghans actually live a good life and for them to actually grow, I mean, actually be a part of gov governing mm. of Afghanistan, if not the entirety of it. Okay. Because you can, by force, maybe punish people, maintain order, but you cannot stimulate an economy. You cannot help education grow. You cannot really help the culture grow. I mean, all the things that a healthy society needs will require a government that is seen as legitimate but by all. Moving on to the next stage, stage of governance we're talking about. Um, so, Nick Kay, I'd like to bring you back in. Uh, Ashraf Ghani has, in part, at least, blamed the Americans for what we're seeing here, the US troop withdrawal. Should the US accept some blame here? I mean, this eventuality must have been foreseen. Yeah, before just that, let me just touch on also the Taliban, if they've changed or, or not changed. Um, personally, I, I see very little indication they have changed very much. But what has changed is the world. And the world today is very, very different from the world even of the late 1990s. And one of the biggest differences is accountability. Accountability for crimes against humanity, for war crimes, accountability also for international crimes such as uh, drug trafficking, etc. The, there are far more mechanisms in place and far more uh, ways in which people will be held accountable in a way they weren't in the 90s. And the Taliban really do need to factor that into their, their equation and their thinking as well. But absolutely, I agree with Haroon that uh, it's a divided nation. They will, uh, they will inherit if they carry on on this on this track and that uh, has no legitimacy the, the people of afghanistan need to see themselves reflected in their government it should be a mirror and the taliban is not that mirror but anyway the us yes i mean it is a mistake from my point of view uh, personal view is it was a mistake to withdraw comprehensively militarily a mistake for two reasons um first because the training advice and assistance mission that was being take, undertaken hadn't been completed. The, the armed forces are still a work in progress and they still needed that assistance. Secondly, it was a mistake politically as well, because it removed immediately the incentive for the Taliban to negotiate in, in good faith and, and properly. Um, I advocated for a long time there should be no comprehensive military withdrawal without a comprehensive peace agreement. Uh, unfortunately, that has not come to pass. I mean, that was part of the uh, the Doha talks, the Doha agreement, though, wasn't it? It was part of the US withdrawal, was that there would be intra-Afghan talks, which obviously have not uh, come to fruition or not to a settlement anyway. Uh, we're heading towards the end of the program. I'd like to come back to you, uh, uh, Shinkai karak -Hale. Just to sort of sum up all of this, how hopeful are you for the future of your country? How do you foresee all of this playing out? Well, let me, uh, before I uh, come to conclusion, one word I want to share that this nation is not divided and won't be divided because Taliban is not belong to one ethnic group, I think, who are fighting in the north or in the east or in the west. But I think in the bad days, Afghan know how to come together and how to get united, that's for sure. Many countries try to how divide this country, but I think they will not succeed. It. I think in bad days, in rainy days, we will be a united nation to to work towards stability of Afghanistan and to preserve what we achieved so far. I think uh, uh, definitely we will have lots of political and security turbulences in the coming days and future. But I think uh, Afghan people will also realize, besides the international community will re realize and we'll see the implication of not supporting and leaving Afghanistan at different stage, which the, 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 the peace talk is started by Khalilzad and it will be ended by them as well. I think Afghan will learn how to protect this country once more and hopefully Taliban understand and realize how to govern uh, the future of Afghanistan, how to make this country back united and work towards okay. uh, developing girls' education and we have to 
realize the enemy, the permanent enemies of Afghanistan and cut their hands from pro continuing a proxy war in this country. All right. We'll have to leave it there for time. Thank you very much uh, to all of our guests, Shinkai Karokel, Harun Rahimi and Sir Nick Kay. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Kim Vanell, and the whole team here in Doha. Bye-bye for now.